Good evening. Hey, my name uh, my name is Glenn Hutchins. Uh, it's my uh, privilege to welcome you here tonight. I'm uh, vice chairman of Brookings and founder of the Hutchins Center. Um, in the Amazon, the rainforest, not the retailer skip, uh, near the rubber trading entrepot of Manaus, there's a phenomenon known as the meeting of the waters. Hey, David, I'm pal. Uh, at which the confluence of two mighty rivers form the Amazon. They are the Rio Negro, which true to its name looks completely black, and the sandy colored Rio Solimoes. I think that's how you pronounce the Portuguese, also known as the upper section of the Amazon. In one of the most stunning sights I've ever beheld in my life, the two rivers merge into one, but run side by side for nearly four miles. Uh, without mixing, uh, do, it turns out due to differences in temperature, speed, and water density. In addition to its breathtaking beauty and unique appearance, the side-by-side -side progress of the two rivers and their eventual, eventual, inevitable, quite natural blending into what is understood to be the world's greatest river have long served in my imagination as a very powerful metaphor. Tonight, uh, today, I guess it's tonight, in a considerably less majestic way, the two Hutchins centers flow together. <laughs> Those of you in D.C. who are in and around the world of Brookings know something about the center created here uh, by David Wessel and me. Where is Dave? Are you here, David, somewhere? There is David over here. Um, uh, on monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, which the, the center, among other purposes, serves as a halfway house for out-of-work economists uh, known as Bent Like Ben Bernanke. Um, all kidding aside, David uh, has created a center of excellence, which makes vitally important but impenetrably abstruse economic policy questions understandable and accessible to non-expert policymakers and to the public at large. In a very similar way, the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard, headed by the inimitable, irrepressible, indefatigable, in irresponsible, is that what you said? That's good. I didn't think about that. <laughs> Indispensable was the word I was going to use. Henry Lewis Skip Gates takes the work of the academy, the view from the ivory tower, and brings it to the public square in a manner which promotes understanding. There she is. Come on in, Elder. Oh, we have a seat for you right here in front. Eleanor Holmes Norton, ladies and gentlemen. So the Hutchins Center at Harvard takes the work of the Academy, the view from the ivory tower, and brings it to the public square in a manner that promotes understanding of perhaps the most important issue in our nation, the history and current state of race relations. The subject of tonight's program, and still I rise, Black America since MLK is an extraordinary example of Skip's ability to reacquaint us with the history of our own era in a manner that educates, provokes, and should motivate us to get back to work at building our more perfect union. Before we get going, I want to take a minute to recognize uh, colleagues and panelists here today. Um, first, we have uh, people who are colleagues of ours at Brookings working on the uh, Race, Place, and Mobility Initiative, Richard Reeves, Elizabeth Kneebone, Bill Galston, Bradley Hardy, and Dana Bowen Matthew. So thank you all for being here and being part of the panel. Many, many of them will be on the panel. We have some of my colleagues from the board, Helene Gale, right here, and her new husband. How you doing, man? Nice to see you. Uh, and is Edgar Rios here, too? I know Edgar was planned to be here. I have, he hasn't gotten here yet. Uh, as also tonight, we have our... Um, Friends from PBS, Sharon Rockefeller. Sharon, thank you. And where's James Blue? Is James here in the audience somewhere? There he is. There's my man, James. Thank you for coming. Um, and uh, I also want to thank my pal, Charlene hunter -Gault, for moderating tonight's panel. And two, panel, two other panelists, Michael Eric Dyson, unfortunately a Wizards fan. We'll have to solve that problem. Uh, and James Peterson uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Is Armstrong Williams here? I thought Armstrong was supposed to come too. He's a, I got you, okay. I wanted to say hi to him. Um, so as, before I turn over this, the microphone to Skip, I want to point out to the Brookings crew here tonight 
that the Rio Negro turns out to be crystal clear. <laughs> the color black emanates upward in a mirror-like reflection of the riverbed. The water is crystal clear. Similarly, Skip's gift for fashioning a clear and compelling narrative from our complex history is an example that we at Brookings should admire and try to emulate. Skip. Thanks so much, Glenn. Give it up for Glenn Hutchins. Glenn's, you know, for those of you who don't know, Glenn and I are very close. You know, we fight like brothers. Um, Glenn's certainly uh, one of my closest friends. But Glenn Hutchins has the distinction of being um, the person who's donated more to African and African American studies than anybody in the history of African and African American studies. And that is the truth. It's the damnedest thing, and it's great. It's a blessing. And every day, um, every day, I'm happy that I'm the director of the Hutchins Center at Harvard. It's a great honor for me. It's great to be at the Brookings. I've been on this board a couple times. Um, sorry, Strobe Talbot can't be here. Uh, he has some family issues, but I want, Strobe and I are Yaleys. I went to Yale. It's a fact that drives Glenn crazy. You know, we go fishing, I wear a Yale cap. He goes like, Yale is a four-letter word if, from where he's from. But uh, I went to Yale 1969. And I got a fellowship my senior year to go to Cambridge. In junior year, I started writing a guest column for the Yale Daily News. And um, because I'd been part of a program called Five Year BA, I'd taken a year off. They picked 12 kids a year to go to the third world and work. And I went to Tanzania because I was pre-med. And I was interested in Africa. And I lived there. I hitchhiked across the equator. When I came back, all my friends were seniors. And um, one of them was running the Yale Daily News, a school newspaper. And he said, why don't you write this guest column? And I did, and, um, and it took off. So anyway, I got a fellowship, the Mellon Fellowship, to go to Cambridge. And as soon as I got it, I thought of Strobe Talbot. Now, why? Because Strobe had graduated. I didn't know him, but he was legendary. He had graduated from Yale, gotten a Rhodes Scholarship to go to Oxford, and Time Magazine hired him to work in the London Bureau because he'd written for the Yale Daily News. So I wrote to the head of Time Magazine, and I said, you did it for Strobe Talbot. How about doing it for me? And to my amazement, they said, why don't you come down, bring, it was Murray Garth, the chief of correspondence, come down, bring copies of your columns. And basically, I had lunch with a guy, and they gave me a job. And for two years, I was a correspondent at Time Magazine all because of Strobe Talbot. I never thought I'd meet him. I used his name in vain like we were best friends or something like that. <laughs> and um, so, and I didn't, you, uh, didn't end up going to med school. I ended up become, having the career that I became, and Strobe had something to do with that. So I would like to thank Strobe Talbot. So give it up for Strobe in his absence, please. <laughs> and by the way, when I was at Yale taking pre-med courses, um, Professor Galston, Arthur Galston, was my biology teacher, so I wonder whose father he was. <laughs> I'd like to thank my friends from WIDA. Um, Sharon Rockefeller and I have been friends for 50 years, and Dalton Delan and Harrington, and their entire team. It's so great. It's a fantasy of mine to be able to make documentary films and to do it at WIDA here in Washington. I grew up three hours west of here, right near Cumberland, Maryland where the Gateses are from, and 25 miles away is Piedmont, West Virginia. And so this is our home team, and to be able to come back here and make films with my, one of my oldest friends is a blessing. I'd like to thank our panelists, whom Glenn thanked under the direction of my running buddy, Charlene hunter Gull, and the funders. You know, a lot of people have great ideas, um, but unless you get the funding, those ideas don't materialize. And Bank of America, and representing Bank of America, our lead funder, Janan Peterson, uh, Crystal Cobb, Rob Scott, Camille John, Barry James, and my good buddy Marilyn Whipple. She and I, been, she'd been dragging me around the country doing these events for the premiere of um, And Still I Rise, and, and we've become very good friends. I'd like to thank uh, Johnson & Johnson, which is my founding sponsor for Finding Your Roots and a, a sponsor for all our Black History series, and, Abby and uh, Howard and Abby Milstein Foundation, uh, the Ford Foundation under Darren Walker, the Mellon Foundation, CPB, and, um, and PBS. So <clears throat> when many of you saw Many Rivers to Cross, and after we did Many Rivers to Cross, which did very well, thank goodness, 
uh, PBS said, we want you to make some more documentaries. So I said, great. And I made a list of 10 documentaries. I showed it to Glenn, showed it to a couple other people, and I showed it to Ken Chenault. And you all know Ken Chenault, the CEO of Amex. And Ken said, um, these are all good, but the best one, the one that you should do next, isn't on the list. It's number 11. And I said, what, which one is that? And he said, you have to do the last 50 years of black history. You have to do our time. Ken and I are about the same age. He studied African-American studies before he went to Harvard Law School. And it never had occurred to me because it's our life. It's our lifetime. I was 15 in 1965. And when he said that, it was like a light bulb going off because I thought, Jesus, when I was 15, 50 years ago was 1915, World War I. Oh, my God. You know, I aged just thinking about that. And um, I realized he was right. And he said, these kids don't know anything about what we went through. They don't know how they got here. They don't know how we got here. And he said, your own kids don't even understand who you are and where you, um, where you came from. And I immediately made it number one. And um, that's what we've done. That's what aired two hours last week. And that's what's uh, going to air tomorrow night. And the conceit is this. If Martin Luther King came back and he said, Michael Eric Dyson, what's been happening since I've gone? You know, what would you say? You'd say, well, Dr. King, Dr. King, since the 1970s, the black middle class doubled. The black upper middle class quadrupled. He'd say, oh, my God. So we, find, we were right. We could wipe out poverty. It sounds so strange to think about this now. But in the 60s, people actually thought poverty was like a virus which could be cured with the right prescription. They thought it was an, an, a, the lack of will, not structural. MLK, remember, was died... Um, 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 marching for the garbage workers, and then planning the Poor People's March here in D.C. So you'd say, Dr. King, no, no, it didn't work that way. He'd say, well, what's the child poverty rate? You'd say, well, when you died, it was 41%. Today, 38%. No model predicted that outcome. None. So we have a class gap, a huge class gap. You know what the Gini coefficient is? Our gap within the race is bigger than it for the white community and for the Latino community. Why? Among other factors, because of affirmative action. Many of us were able to take advantage of affirmative action. That's why, why did I end up at Yale and not at Howard, like three generations of my family? Because of affirmative action. I go to Yale, September 1969, 96 black kids showed up. The class of 66 had six. What was there, a genetic blip in the race, and all of a sudden there are 90 smart black people who didn't exist in 1966? Of course not. Who's in that class? Sheila Jackson Lee, congresswoman from Houston. Kurt Schmoke, first black mayor of, of Baltimore. Kurt got a, a Rhodes Scholarship in 71. That's when I decided I wanted to go to Oxford and Cambridge, too. <laughs> um, and then there was a little nerdy guy, wore glasses. I didn't know him very well. He was pre-med. Um, I would see him at uh, what we called Soul Food, Soul, Soul Food Weekend once a month every each of the 12 colleges at Yale as part of uh, the diversity initiative, though we didn't use that word then, had to have chitlins and fried chicken. You know? And I would see him there, uh, but it didn't occur to me that, that, I mean, years later, I would see his name even on schools. And I had forgotten that we were classmates until I did his family tree for Finding Your Roots. Ben Carson. <laughs> ben Carson was in our class, too. Um, we were beneficiaries of affirmative action. Lonnie Guineer says that affirmative action was a class escalator. And we rode that escalator up the socioeconomic scale, moving from what my mother used to call, God rest her soul, Mike, colored money to white money, right? That's what it was about. It was about integrating the power structures in the United States. Someone flipped the switch and turned that escalator off. And all those people were left behind. So we have this huge class gap within the African American community. And privately, some of our greatest so, uh, social scientists, uh, black and white, think that that class gap is permanent unless there's massive intervention from private industry and from government. Uh, after the recent election results, I don't really see that happening. So anyway, uh, we started in 1965 when I was 15. What happened in 1965? Pettus Bridge beatings, which I watched on TV with my parents right up there in Piedmont, West Virginia, in our little black and white TV. Um, the Watts riots right after 
um, within a few days of the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and then what the premiere in the fall, first black actor, primetime TV drama, Bill Cosby starring in I Spy. And Bill Cosby was a Rhodes Scholar. Everybody forgets that that character was. We start with that amazing year, and we travel through Black Power and Black is Beautiful and Julia and Flip Wilson, Afro Sheen and Soul Train, the election of Maynard Jackson and Richard Hatcher. We go on to the rise of Oprah and the genius of the two Michaels, Michael Jackson and Michael Jordan. The age of Jesse Jackson, <laughs> I was... Um, about to, to leave to go to spend the day filming Jesse Jackson for the series, and my cell phone rang, and it was Jesse Jackson. He calls me professor, I called him reverend, and I go, uh, reverend, I'm on my way to, to the airport to fly to Chicago. And he said, well, um, uh, professor, I see that my, you want me to spend all day with you. You know, he said, I don't spend all day with anybody. And I said, well, I understand that, reverend. I said, um, but you see, we need to spend the day with you. And he goes, well, why do you need that much time? How about one hour? And I said, well, Reverend, there are people in America today, particularly younger people, but some older people too, who don't remember that the 80s really should be called the age of Jesse Jackson. <laughs> Unbeknownst to me, his assistant was listening on the phone, and Jesse said, uh, Matilda, clear my day for Dr. Gates. <laughs> 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 then Rodney King and Anita Hill, the growth of the black middle class and the horrible era of mass incarceration of black men, all the way to the election and re-election of the first black president, and then, of course, the rise of Black Lives Matter. So this is very much the story of my generation and the amazing things that have happened to my generation. But so on the one hand, it's a story of incredible progress of the most successful period of African-American history by any measure, a period of unprecedented growth, change, and enormous hope. But of course, that's not the whole story, because at the same time, over these same five decades, far too many black lives have remained trapped in impoverished circumstances, lives largely devoid of hope. The choice is determined by structural inequalities, which do much of the same work that old school racism used to do. While since 70, as I said, the black middle class has doubled, the black upper middle class has quadrupled, the child poverty rate is basically the same. Um, and MLK would be horrified by that. And consider these statistics. In 1970, 148,000 black men in prison. By 2014, 831,000. The likelihood that a black man will go to prison, and that's not jail, is one in three. What's the comparable rate for white men? One in 17. 25% of the victims of, pe of people killed by the police since 2015 have been black people, twice our average in the population. How did this happen? How did we, a half century after the apex of Dr. King's civil rights movement, arrive at this paradox, where at the same time that we elected a black president twice, we have to proclaim through a new civil rights movement that black lives matter. And God only knows what's gonna happen over the next four years. I have to say, when Wolf Blitzer called the election for Donald Trump, I felt for the first time, for the first time, I began to imagine what Frederick Douglass felt the day of the hayes tilden Compromise, which ended Reconstruction. And I wonder if historians will look back at this 50-year period and see it as the second Reconstruction, the period between 1965 and 2015. And there are forces that are trying to roll that back. And no one during Reconstruction, no one, no one, we elected black senators, we elected black members of the House, we elected black legislators, all men, of course, because this is 1866 to 1876, no one believed that by 1900, there would be no black men left in Congress. Nobody believed that was possible. No one believed that there would be de jure segregation introduced after 1890, the Separate Car Act, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody in 1875 believed that. And that's the historical model that we have to keep in mind so that we anticipate and remain vigilant. This is the dilemma that this series confronts. We're at a crucial point in our history, and with this series, I hope to reflect on our recent past as a way of helping to devise ways to forge a better f a future. And as I said, this series is very personal for me. One I'm glad to share with the PBS community, thanks to the generous support, Bank of America, Johnson & Johnson, and Sharon Rockefeller at WIDA. Thanks to PBS for giving me a national platform, and thanks to my buddy, Glenn Hutchins, 
for opening the doors of the Brookings and to all of you for coming. I'd like you to see a few uh, clips and then we're going to have our panel discussion led by none other than Charlene hunter Gall. Thank you very much. My grandparents were colored. My parents were Negroes. And me, I'm black. Over my lifetime, I've seen astonishing progress. I'm black and beautiful. African Americans have achieved so much in so many ways surpassing our greatest hopes and our wildest dreams. We're visible in virtually every facet of American life, defining its face and its voice to the world. One day when the glory comes. Yet far too many black lives are still threatened by harsh inequalities. we still have to march to protect our rights. 50 years ago, I thought that by now, we would have been long past all this. How did we get here? How have we come so far and yet have so far to go? to think about how long blackness had been associated with negative stereotypes and ugliness and stupidity and low social status just to be able to claim no this thing that we are the way we look this is positive and powerful and beautiful that was huge even soul brother number one the immensely popular james brown abandoned his signature patent leather processed hairstyle for a natural kicky headed afro Hello, this is Don Ward from One Black Dignity. Yeah, what's happening, James? Well, I just wanted to ask you one question. Uh-huh. I'd like to know why you got your process cut. Well, this is a black move, and uh, regardless of what you're thinking, we've all got to think one way. And if we look alike, we can think alike. You know, the way I see it, it's really what your mind that counts. Huh? Well, the mind counts, but see, we all don't have a good image. And the image is like black. See, we've never thought together. You know, in Africa, a man can do what he want to do because he know who he is. Right. Over here, you don't know. Uh -huh. So first, we got to get an image, an identity. And Brown didn't just change his look. He also recorded a song that would become a black power anthem. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. We've got to remember what, what a thinker Brown was about how to deal in segregated, racist, apartheid America. James Brown understood from the experience he had as a child. Dark-skinned black people are especially hated in this culture. They are seen as the true black people worth hating. James Brown's impact on the cultural life of people my age is, is profound. There's a way in which the music that he makes, and I don't know if unmitigated blackness is the right way to frame it, but he's just black, you know what I'm saying? Like unashamed, direct, forthright, powerful, in your face blackness. Progress was taking place in ways that I could glimpse, but not yet fully understand. I think it's important to point out that 
the actual policies that were enacted in response to the civil rights movement are actually creating more open spaces. So black folks are more a part of society, like literally are coming out of the shadows, uh, are voting, can move around in public spaces in different ways. Because of that movement, so much has happened. Because of that movement, people have a seat at the table. Because of that movement and the heroes and the sheroes of that movement, America has changed for the better. In essence, the victories of the civil rights movement meant that African Americans were equal before the law. And finally given the chance, we were making significant gains. Some were economic. By the late 1960s, the percentage of black families living in poverty was dropping. Unemployment was decreasing. And black incomes were rising at the fastest rate in history. But many of the most visible gains were cultural. Black culture was permeating mainstream American culture like never before. You could hear it in music, see it in advertising. Oh, I don't use just mouthwash, I use Listerine. And even watch it on television. When I was a kid, it was extremely rare to see any black people on TV. I remember how excited my whole neighborhood got any time an African-American appeared, even in a minor part. When Bill Cosby got a starring role on I Spy back in 1965, we were ecstatic. And by the late 1960s, we started to see more shows with black stars and black co-stars. Then, in 1971, there was a show made just for us. Soul Train, 60 non-stop minutes across the tracks of your mind into the exciting world of soul. And uh, welcome aboard for another super hip ride on the Soul Train. Created and hosted by visionary entrepreneur Don Cornelius, Soul Train brought black music, dancing, and fashion into homes all across America. Back then, when I finally got my Afro at 16, Soul Train. I know all of the dances. Mm -hmm. Don Cornelius, he had the presence to show us how to live our best lives. We wish you love, peace, and so. <laughs> Hidden beneath the data was a frightening fact. As the black middle class followed white Americans in moving out of inner cities, the poorest African Americans were becoming increasingly isolated, socially, geographically, and economically. In essence, class differences were fracturing black America. For the first time, really in American history, you will begin to see classes of African Americans living in different places. Uh, because prior to that, the options were so few and limited, no matter how much you made, for the most part, you were going to be buying, shopping, going to school, and working and living uh, within the confines of a black community. Integration had its downside. It removed the role models. It removed some of the stabilizing personalities and characters and, and, and involved business people and and doctors and lawyers. It moved them out of the community. In the 1950s, black communities were the most civilized communities in America. There was ties of empathy and bonds of sympathy, unbelievable embrace of others who came in out of the 70s. We don't have neighborhoods as much as we got hoods. As black America transformed, a sociologist named William Julius Wilson began mapping its growing class divide, looking at how the poorest among us were being left behind. At the time, his work was controversial. Overwhelming emphasis on Today, it seems clear that he was right. Second and third generation. Wilson is my friend and colleague, and he remains a crucial witness to our shared history. When we were coming along in the 60s, watching Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement, there was an expectation that once we dismantled de jure segregation, we would all 
Right. 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 The civil rights victories really did not have much of an impact, a uh, positive impact on the black poor. So whereas one segment of the black population is indeed uh, enjoying some success, mm -hmm. another segment uh, is in danger of becoming permanent economic proletarians. Best of times, worst of times. Yeah, absolutely. In a way that we have not seen historically in the history of the African-American people. Precisely. I remember one scholar saying that it's as if racism, having put blacks in our economic place, stepped aside to watch changes in the economy and the technological revolution uh, destroy that place. Among the many neighborhoods hit hard by Reaganomics was New York City's crumbling South Bronx. By the time Reagan took office, property values here had dropped so low that some desperate landlords torched their own empty buildings for the insurance money. It literally was burning. Things were on fire all the time. There were a lot of tenement buildings that would be there one day and then kind of be burnt out the next. Mattresses thrown into lots that had a lot of rubble. And we played in those. Growing up at that time required a great deal of street smarts. Like being a 10, 11 year old girl, having to get up to the 17th floor in a project building where the lights are all out in the stairways. You know what I mean? Yet beneath the decay, were the stirrings of something radically new. Good times. Good times. For years, young people here had been experimenting with art, dance, fashion, and music. They called it hip hop. It would come to energize black America in ways that people of my generation never saw coming, never even imagined possible. In the schoolyard during recess, someone would have a boombox. Then someone would start rhyming. Everyone was doing it. Give me five, I know it ain't no job. Hit me on the slap me on the black hand side. You know, it was always a rhyming rhythm, rhythm thing with black people anyway, just in conversation. It was just an instant thing that hit you. Hip-hop was an entire culture seemingly created out of fragments. Electricity stolen from streetlights. Sound systems made out of spare parts. Parties staged in abandoned lots. And a distribution system that was 100% improvisation. One, two, one, two. Clap the hands, everybody. And everybody, clap the hands. You couldn't purchase you know, albums or records, and you couldn't hear hip-hop on the radio. And the only way that you could participate in the culture musically uh, was through these cassette tapes, which would circulate all throughout the city. People just dubbing uh, and redubbing and redubbing until the audio quality was so terrible you could barely make it out. But this was how the music circulated in these kind of underground networks. Now what you hear is not a test, I'm rapping to the beat. And me, the groove, and my friends are gonna try to move your feet. As its influence spread, the music moved out of the underground and away from homemade cassettes. In 1979, a group from suburban New Jersey released one of the very first hip hop records, Rapper's Delight. That was the first time that I heard hip hop on the radio. And I remember the next day we were all talking about it. Yo, did you hear it? But there was this sort of pride of like, wow, other people are listening to something that comes from the hood, which ironically, you know, those guys are from Jersey. Like, you know I mean? It's not like they were like hood deep or anything like that, but it felt like that. Rapper's Delight was a sensation. It broke into the top 40 and became the biggest selling 12 inch single ever. Older folks are really poo-pooing on hip hop. 
it's, it, you know, it's not really music. It's just like based on everybody else's stuff. They're not singing, they're just talking on records. But when I hear those guys spitting through the radio on Rapper's Delight, that's when I'm like, that's, that's me. It's the first time I'm hearing like me on the radio. Rapper's Delight was only the beginning. Soon hip hop was no longer just party music. It was connecting young black people in different parts of the country. Our generation of young people, we had to find new ways to communicate, you know, by just getting on the records and speaking about the truth. We were saying, hey, we are, I'm over here, I'm in Long Beach. This is what's going on over here, where y'all at? Yeah, well, I'm over in Queensbridge, and this is what it is over here. So we're all hearing about these different places. As hip hop evolved, it became a national phenomenon, a passion shared by millions of young African Americans who used it to articulate their identity, celebrate their lives, and offer up a powerful critique of mainstream America, reaching ahead with a group that seemed to synthesize almost two decades of the black experience into one furious sound, Public Enemy. Yo, check this out, man. We rolling this way. That march in 1963, that was a bit of nonsense. We ain't rolling like that no more. Public Enemy takes a lot of the politics and energy from the Black Power Movement, a few James Brown samples, right? Some rock stuff in there as well, and really just punches everybody in the face. Myself and for virtually every black person I knew, it was awe-inspiring. None of us, not a single one of us, had grown up believing we would live to see this day. If there is anyone out there who still doubts that America is a place where all things are possible. We still question the power of our democracy. Tonight is your answer. It's been a long time coming. But tonight, because of what we did on this day, in this election, at this defining moment, change has come to America. The victory offered African Americans of all generations a chance to celebrate and reflect. To young people like my daughters, it seemed to promise a new age. To civil rights veterans like my friend Charlene Hunter Galt, it felt like the culmination of a lifelong struggle. And Obama's inauguration was something she had to see in person. I had to be there on that really cold day <laughs> as a small part of that movement that made his election possible. The president-elect of the United States, Barack H. Obama. It was a wonderful camaraderie. But I had to walk away because uh, the people that I felt the closest to Some of them couldn't be there. I know. And I could. Mm -hmm. I found myself humming that old freedom song, you know, we've come a mighty long way. And uh, then I went back and listened to the first black president take the oath of office. <laughs> I, Barack Hussein Obama. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. The idea that there is a black president, president to the United States. that black people can go out and say, there is somebody that looks like me in the White House, that there is a family that looks like me in the White House, it is huge. I'm proud of Barack Obama. 
I'm proud that four black women and girls live in the White House. I think there's something absolutely awesome about that. You know, there are black hair care products in the White House. You know, there's Pico on moisturizer in the White House, which is, you know, iconic. Like, that, that matters. That matters representationally. It matters culturally. It matters. That image of seeing him on every TV every day, being the leader of the free world, it showed that America has made significant progress. You better believe, no matter what his policies are, and no matter what he does with it, you can never change the fact that he has changed this country and the world forever. Wait till you get everybody on. <laughs> he says I'm live. Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, let me also thank all of you for being here. Um, I've been a part of this, um, what I'm now calling a movement, uh, following Skip Gates around. Uh, with his wonderful documentaries and uh, something that I'll talk about at the end, what I think it really represents. But in the meantime, uh, I want to have our panel talk about what they think it represents uh, by going back, as we just went on uh, part of the, the excerpts from the series. And we're going to do a sort of then and now kind of thing for a few minutes and um, and see where it uh, see where it takes us <clears throat> so I'm happy to see all of you thank you so much I didn't have anything to put my questions in so I picked up the hotel <laughs> menu <laughs> <laughs> breakfast lunch <clears throat> really good dinner <laughs> So I'm thinking this is going to be dessert <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> for dinner. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I love that first part with James Brown singing, I'm black and I'm proud. Now, I've known the congresswoman a long time before she was a congresswoman when, in fact, she had an afro. What do you think I have now? <laughs> and, uh, right. It's not like the one you had. <laughs> But if any, what's the new TV show that's uh, about you? Um, Good Girls Revolt. Good Girl, yeah. The, the, the actress who plays Eleanor has an afro like the one <laughs> she used to have, if you're interested. It's not like this one. But Eleanor, tell me uh, about it. Uh, was it unmitigated blackness, to borrow a phrase? <laughs> See, you weren't on the last panel I did, so I stole that, but now I have to acknowledge <laughs> that I stole it from you. <laughs> but was it unmitigated blackness that you experienced wearing your afro? Uh, I, I, I must say, when I first got my afro, uh, and, and as I say this, let me be clear that black women feel free to wear their hair anyway now. But when I was a kid growing up and when I got my afro, there was only one way to wear your hair. So, you got to come to grips with um, what it meant to be one of the first people in your neighborhood, even your husband didn't know that you were going to get your hair cut that day. Um, to reverse, essentially, 400 years of who you were supposed to be by making a statement about who you are today. So it was certainly unmitigated. It was in your face. It was, we're ready. And that was the important thing. We're ready. Now y'all get ready too. Not y'all are ready, and we'll try to follow you. 
Michael Eric Dodson, it's a little hard for me to imagine you have an afro at this point, but you <laughs> probably had one at one point, right? What did it mean to you? I had a Michael Jackson afro. <laughs> you know, the big bushy fro. I don't know why it's hard for you to imagine that. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> um, it, it meant that we were re-kinking our hair to reclaim our blackness. And, and it comes full circle. You see Solange, a seat at the table says, don't touch my hair. Because the follicular fidelity of black hair. <laughs> the way in which it stayed where it was put. When people were talking about good hair, what's good hair? That obeys you when you tell it to stay. <laughs> and so that Afro was important because I had good yellow Negro hair. And I was warned, if you get an Afro, you will lose your curls. But I was deeply in love with Angela Davis. <laughs> and in the future with Pam Greer, <laughs> So those two leading ladies lit my path toward a kind of reclaimed blackness. And that Afro was extremely important. It allowed me to identify with the masses of black people. I had a dashiki and a kantiki that I put around my neck. And I felt that I was uh, ready for the revolution, the revolution of consciousness, the revolution of understanding that we as a black people could forge connections and build links that would allow us to narrate our own story through our bodies. Our bodies were, as the Bible said, living epistles. And so our hair was telling a story. And I was proud to participate uh, in that revolution and to join my hair with the hair of others uh, to make a difference. Well, James Peterson, you, you seem to, in the, in the little clip we saw, not be totally in love with the notion of unmitigated blackness. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that, but and you're much too young to have worn an afro. I had an afro but, a couple years ago. Yeah, you, right. You but, but we're going to come TV. around again. Yeah, right. <laughs> but but why did you hesitate on the phrase unmitigated blackness? So so uh, uh, props, Professor Gates, for all your work. Mm -hmm. But but one of the things, you know, I'm a literary scholar, and I've really studied under Professor Gates in certain ways, and and there have been great debates about essentializing blackness and really complicated discussions about what happens when you reduce blackness to a set of phenotypical or visual characteristics. And so I've come up in that way, and Professor Gates could, could reproduce these debates for you better than I can, but really complicated theoretical debates about not reducing blackness um, uh, to its sort of constitutive elements and thinking about the complexities of it always. And so it's a great question to ask because I'm hesitating in that moment because I'm trying to give folks a sense of and you, when you sit for these documentaries, you're sitting for hours answering questions. Tell right? me about it. <laughs> right. You're sitting for hours answering questions. And I'm really trying to give folks a sense of what the impact that James Brown had on young folk, on folks of my generation. And so we don't really, we didn't really capture all the complexities of James Brown dealing with his identity. The way we engage James Brown as really as the site of authenticity at the core of hip hop aesthetic production. And for like young inner city folks, I'm from Newark, New Jersey, that's just a really powerful and empowering thing. And so I, I wanted to, I really just wanted to say unmitigated, right? But I mitigated myself understanding, that, <laughs> you, know, I, my, you know, my sort of ideal sort of listener here is Professor Gates. And he would, he would challenge me a little bit on trying to reduce blackness to any sort of simple set of characteristics. So that was the, the hesitation there. Well, Dan, are you two are too young to have gone through what Eleanor went through <laughs> and what I went through. But uh, when you look back at that period and w when you examine it, what, do you, what, is it, what comes to your mind? The parallels, the parallels with what we are doing today, right? Because the Afro movement back then is very similar to the natural mm -hmm. hair movement today, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so Professor Gates does a, a fabulous job of saying, we've come so far, but yet we have so far to go, right? Mm -hmm. How do we end up here where we have to march in the street and say Black Lives Matter? Why is that even a statement that I have to make about myself? Why do I have to have a natural hair movement today? What has not changed? So the parallels between how I felt, yes, I was very young, very young um, mm -hmm. at the time, and how I feel today, right, when I have to do a repeat mm -hmm. of the same expression, the same reclamation of my body, the same expression of my value, it feels 
very parallel. So are you saying what goes around comes around or something like it that? It appears that it or does. Or deja vu all over again? I would or? say it's, it's different in some ways, but so much the same in other ways that are really quite troubling. Now, my good buddy here, I guess I better be a little bit careful because I don't think there was ever a time you could have had an afro. <laughs> <laughs> How well you know me already. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and also you are of a different generation as well. But you lived in another country. Does any of this have any resonance for you? That's a great question. Um, I get paid for uh, it. I'm, <laughs> I'm honestly sitting here as a Brookings scholar with lots of charts and kind of figures uh, and data to hide behind. But I was born after the civil rights movement in, in a different country. And <laughs> I'm, I've clearly always been white. Um, uh, so why, why am I here? Because of the the work that I do at Brookings has led me to believe that the idea that actually in the end that race was going to be substituted by class and that de jure equality followed by liberalization of attitudes and economic growth would basically, although it would take time, would kind of get us there. And it feels to me, just looking at the data, that this has been a, a stalled century in terms of the median black economic experience, and to some extent that's been hidden by the exceptional and very moving uh, election of Barack Obama. And so I work on mobility here in the US, and I see that, 20, that the kids who were born poor, the black kids who were born poor, half of them are still poor as adults, whereas only half the white kids who are born poor as adults. Black kids who are born into the middle class are twice as likely to fall down as white kids who are born into the middle class, intergenerationally. And so you see that. And so if you just work in the field and look at the figures, and it's, it's been slow for me to get to this, it's an unavoidable fact that the material differences between the experience of poor black Americans and white Americans is unavoidable. And I now think, particularly in the light of the election and, and what's happening. We're the, going to get to that in a minute. <laughs> okay. Hold on. Not yet. Right. Hold on. Because there's a lot to chew on yeah, there. I shouldn't, even open, I shouldn't even open that up. Probably. And I hope we have time to do it. But I, I just want to stay in the past for another minute or two and ask you, uh, James, you know, what is the equivalent of the black is beautiful thing that we saw then that we see today? And, and, and because you go deep into rap. Mm -hmm. and, and rap music. Is, is that the equivalent of Black is Beautiful today, or what? You know, when I, when I think about, you know, I think of Black is Beautiful as kind of an ideological concept that really did animate my youth, right? My parents were really big on, on embracing it, and I think what's happened is, is that um, that concept was so dense for the Black community that it really has great tentacles throughout Black popular culture right now. So I, I would count Black Lives Matter as an extension of that. I would certainly account certain aspects of hip hop culture as an extension of that. I would account uh, for the natural hair movement as an extension of that. I mean, there are, there are certainly things that, that we can look at in the contemporary black popular cultural moment and trace its roots back to that simple sort of aesthetic statement. And so when you think about um, you know, when you think about a seat at the table, or you think about the kind of music that Kendrick Lamar makes, and you see people sort of reflecting on like the size of their nose or contemplating like what sort of is the sort of existential angst of being black in this society. Anybody who has a black daughter in the 21st century knows that even though we've sort of come through black is beautiful and we wear natural hair, the challenges around aesthetic ideals for young women of color are still in place. But you, 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 I watched you not long ago uh, do a YouTube thing. I don't know how old it was, but it seemed very current to me. You called it all black everything, yeah. bringing back black or bringing black back. Yeah. I'm black. <laughs> this is my blog. <laughs> and, and you said that, you said that <laughs> what, what rap is doing today is forcing us to rethink how race relations operate in the 21st century, but it challenges us. And he talked about the nuances of the moment. Now, some of it got a little academic for me, but uh, that was essentially how I saw it. Can you break it down for us? Yeah, I mean, when, so when, when Professor Gates talks about his early genealogy and he says, you know, my great, great parents were colored, my uh, parents were Negro, and I'm black, I'm applauding that, right? Because for me, 
blackness for us now in the 21st century is a really, really important identifier, not to dismiss african Americanness, but blackness is a really important identifier. Now, what hip hop has done is pushed blackness as an identi identity category to the foreground. And the reason why that's important is because when you look at blackness in the 21st century, one of the challenges for us within the black community is to embrace the diversity within the black community. Right, so this seems a little bit strange to some folks, but sometimes like the African American identity within blackness mm -hmm. sort of functions hegemonically. I don't want to be academic, but it sort of it elides Please, other <laughs> it elides it elides other identities within the black community. And so we need to bring black back, right, in order to capture some of the diversity within the black experience. And so hip hop does that sort of inherently because it emerges out of this sort of black diasporic moment. You have folks from all throughout the Caribbean, you have Latino folks, you have black folks from different regions, all contributing to the sort of developments of hip hop culture and all the aesthetics of it, all the cultural products of it sort of reflect that diverse blackness. And so that's part of what I'm trying to get back to. Michael Eric Dyson, does that have an impact in the larger society? Because, no, go yeah. ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, of course because the society uh, wants to be black, except for the burden of it, as Greg Tate would say. <laughs> Want to be black like Justin Timberlake until it comes time to pay the tax of blackness. Mm. When you sound like a black person, the sonic blackness is the appropriation of that blackness to articulate a powerful American identity. But when the penalty is imposed, uh, there is a retreat back into the privilege of whiteness. So blackness has metastasized across the body politic. Blackness is what it means to be an American. You cannot think about what it means to be an American without thinking about black folk, whether it's Beyonce or her husband Jay-Z, whether it's the president presently for the next few days <laughs> of the United States of America and his wife and their children. They have redefined domesticity in, in black America, in America. When you think about the fact that uh, Toni Morrison uh, is still living and breathing among us, uh, mm. arguably the greatest writer that we've produced in the context of our struggle in America. So yeah, uh, that blackness has metastasized, so to speak, spread out. And when you think about hip hop culture uh, that Professor Peterson has brilliantly spoken about, that hip hop culture was denigrated among African American people while it was being simultaneously embraced by the dominant culture. I was there, I know. Turn that damn music down. Elvis was a hero to most, but he never meant shit to me. Straight up racist, the sucker was simple and plain. Motherfuck him and John Wayne. <laughs> so when you've got Chuck D saying that and black people are like, oh my God, uh, turn that stuff down. And now all those people who desire a political sensibility within hip hop denied it when it was at its political height. But some engaging entrepreneur white brothers and sisters saw this as a means to not only commercialize and commodify black consciousness and imagination, but to figure out a way to allow these young black artists to express themselves. Mm -hmm. And so hip hop is a powerful paradigm of that. Think about all of the ideas uh, that have come out as a result of that. Uh, Professor Peterson mentioned Kendrick Lamar. Kendrick Lamar, uh, Beyonce, um, Common's new album, Alicia black Keys, America, are leading yeah. a revival and a renaissance of blackness in our time in ways that harken back to the 60s, where the, the height of black artistic expression by these young artists who have now become politicized. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, uh, the dominant world sees that blackness and gets afraid of it at the same time. I know we're going to talk about it later. Yeah, we but are. This, this election was a referendum on blackness. Okay. Uh, that's your position, and we'll discuss it. Uh, I ain't speaking for no but, damn body but, else but, but me. But, <laughs> then, uh, but, but also, Eleanor, at, at that time, black feminism uh, and Hollywood's portrayal of blacks in film, we saw a little bit of that uh, a few minutes ago. How do you assess the impact of black, the black and proud movement opening the way for black feminism, and how different was it from white feminism? Well. Feminism, when, when feminism arose in the 1960s, it was uh, different for women of every kind, because women had never thought of themselves, <laughs> uh, these white women, as a particularly disadvantaged group. Uh, as far as black women were concerned, the overlap between the women's movement and the, Afri and the, and the civil rights movement caused some confusion. Uh, Black people were trying to get their arms around what it meant to bring change in this country. And here come a large group, a much larger group, who are not necessarily black, in fact, were white, 
uh, who are trying to do the same thing. And it really took some leadership on the part of some black women, and they ought to be uh, understood, who understood they were both mm -hmm. black and women. At the same People time. People like Shirley Chisholm. Mm -hmm. That was the name coming to Like Dorothy yeah. Height. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it took that kind of leadership to, to engage this community, this confusion, to understand this confusion, mm -hmm. to, to deal with this confusion within the community. You know, I'm proud, although I was not in Congress at the time, uh, that the uh, Congressional Black Caucus uh, was among the first to understand, since then, Shirley Chisholm helped them along, mm -hmm. <laughs> to understand you had to speak for black women and for women. Yeah, that's what I was most others ask you. did. did it, sorry, pardon me, but did that twain never meet mm -hmm. the, the, the black feminists and the white feminists? Of course they met, but you know, but it was very difficult. Look again, uh, you know, when when a uh, straight-out civil rights activist and a leader of the women's movement like Gloria Steinem, this gorgeous white woman, you know, comes forward and talks about feminism, uh, she's she is still the very best. But it is very hard for black women to identify with her initially. So what you got to do is to separate out the beginnings, late 60s, to huge, the most important movements in the 20th century arise at the same time. And then they say, you all, so, you all sort it out. It took real leadership for that sorting out to occur. Dana, let me ask you, um, you know, there was that period yeah. where there were a lot of black things on television, and then it all seemed to go away. Mm -hmm. And we just had Oscars so white, mm -hmm. and the Emmys got a little bit better. Uh, what happened to that movement? And also, do you see it coming back with things like Blackish and some of the <laughs> you know, other things that are on television now? Do you, what happened then, and do you see more diversity now? So I'm going to lift up black women for a moment because we are, um, yes, coming back, but we have not lost our way. From the time that you were talking about, Representative, um, when the two movements appeared to meet till early November the election, we voted as a block. Um, and we voted our interest and the country's interest, even though others were confused, right? <laughs> so, and I mean that, I really mean that, because we have not lost our way and we True. continue to produce television and music and uphold mm -hmm. families and try to keep this country on track. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanna say, <laughs> thank you. Um, we didn't get confused. Um, so to the extent that it's coming back, yes, I believe that we will. Uh, black womenhood um, will lead the way. Um, we're doing it in television. We're doing it in movies. We're doing it in journalism. Shonda Rhimes owns Thursday exactly. night. Exactly, <laughs> owns Thursday night, um, and continues to put it out front. So I want, I want to say you're welcome. Mm. Right? All right. All right. So, so do you see progress on television? Because every time I turn on television now, there seems to be another African-American show or people in commercials. Is it happening? I just want to be careful here because I feel like the reconstruction redemption model is sort of like the black American dialectic, right? We're always sort of coming back and forth. And, and you know, critical race theorists for a long time, way before I came into the academy, were saying this, that we have to be careful about the seductiveness of incremental progress, right? And I think all of us are learning that as a very tough lesson right now. We have to be very, very careful about that and also black exceptionalism, which is another thing I was talking about. So, Sometimes black exceptionalism obscures the challenges that we have to look forward to and the challenges and the work that we still have to do. Imani Perry is great on this um, and, and, um, and more beautiful, more terrible. Uh, black women are killing it on scholarship as well, right? Yes, we are. Um, and so I, I think, I think that, that that model is something we should be really suspicious of, which is, you know, there's, of course, there's going to be incremental progress. You'll see black folks pop up on TV. There will be a Shonda Rhimes. But we can't allow exceptional success to obscure the work that still has to be done. And unfortunately, we've been lulled into that sleep. Um, and this is the reason why certain pockets of radicalism are, are cropping up amongst, amongst young people today, because they've already peeped the, the sort of the limitations of 
incremental progress. It's no disrespect to civil rights at all, right? It's no disrespect to like the legislative process. It's just an understanding of that reconstruction redemption model. We make progress and the forces of white supremacy and institutional racism fight back very, 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 very harshly, very, very difficultly. So, yep. so we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a double bind in some ways. Right. Well, let, 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 let's turn that page now and look at what um, William Julius Wilson said in our little excerpt there, because he said that the civil rights movement had no impact on the black poor. And in Florida, where I live part of a year, when friends of mine were canvassing uh, during this last uh, election campaign, there were blacks in you know, lower income neighborhoods saying they weren't gonna vote because nothing good had happened to them for them in the past eight years. So mm -hmm. I'd like to go now to uh, you, Richard, because you alluded earlier to something that um, William Julius Wilson also said. I mean, Skip talked about how, uh, you know, for the first time we've got a strong black middle class. We have even Skip Gates in the upper Classes, huh? but. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, so what are we looking at here when we look at the black community? How does it divide? Yeah. I noticed you didn't ask me about television, which was probably wise, although with teenage kids I would talk about Luke Cage, for example, <laughs> um, which uh, I think is just absolutely... Oh, black. Yes. yes, and a fabulous, uh, fabulous series. So I was very struck by the figures that Skip had about the increase in the size of the black middle class and the black upper middle class. Um, and, and it is actually useful in some ways to have a kind of outsider perspective on this. This is where it is useful not to come from here because it changes your reference point. I find the same in the discussions about segregation. People will say, look, racial segregation's come down. Well, it could only come down from where it started. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly and, and by right. comparison to where I come from, London, uh, black neighborhoods are still three times as segregated as they, as they are in, in the UK yeah. um, and elsewhere. <laughs> Similarly, yes, the black middle class and upper middle class grew. It could only grow. Right. So my immediate question as a social scientist, well, well what was the base, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think one of the things I really liked about this is the intersection of class and race. Mm -hmm. And to be very clear about it, the danger that there is enough black success and enough people break through yeah that it does allow a story to be told, yeah. not only, well, look, things look pretty good. There's yeah. a lot of black people on TV, and look, yeah. there's even one in the White House now. Yeah. And then you look at the data, and you think, but hold on a second, you've basically seen a stalled century yeah. in mm. terms of actual material progress. And so it's the, in some ways, it's the kind of worst of all worlds in terms of radical change, because enough <laughs> happens for whites to be able to convince themselves, as half do now, that discrimination against whites is as big a problem as discrimination right. against blacks. That? Because you've got this public perception which is so far <laughs> away from the reality. You know, um, back in 1968, um, when the cities exploded all around the nation, um, President Johnson appointed a, committee, a commission that the shorthand for it was the Kerner Commission. Mm -hmm. And its conclusion was that this nation was moving in two separate directions, one white and prospering, one black and poor. But what I'm hearing in the data that you're talking about is there's a white and prospering, there's a black and prospering to a certain extent, maybe, right. and then there's a poor that isn't really a permanent underclass that we're looking at. You. Well, I'll speak. I mentioned the upward mobility figures. We also see from recent work by Raj Chetty and others that Mm. One of the best predictors of an area that doesn't have upward mobility is how many black people live there. So the predominantly black areas have much less upward mobility. And you can see from the longitudinal data, you can see um, from Pat Sharkey at NYU, the incredible proportion of black kids who live in a high poverty area just as their parents did. He calls it the inheritance of the ghetto. It's his phrase, not mine. And so I see huge hugely structural, semi-permanent factors at work for a huge majority, uh, huge numbers of, of black Americans, which is belied by the apparent success of a few. And I think uh, your point is, you know, never mistake the exception for the rule. Yeah, um, but I yeah. fear that recent trends make me think that that is kind of what's happening, and that feels like a dangerous moment to me. Yeah. So Michael Eric Dyson, you know, it, we were all, and I can't speak for every single person in this room, but the fact that you're here probably means you felt the same way I did about um, 
Barack Obama's election. Mm -hmm. So why are those people in Florida saying what they are saying? And why is Richard citing the stats he's talking about when we thought we were using the phrase post-racial America? What happened? Mm -hmm. Some of us. Some, <laughs> Some of us were not. Well, uh, <laughs> Obama never used it. To, let's be sure about that. In his book, uh, in his second book, The Audacity of Hope, he said, of one black guy in the Senate does not betoken a post-racial America. So to his credit, he resisted that notion from the very beginning. But look, America thought we had been there and done black. When we got the first black president, we thought all the stuff was solved in a kind of magical wave of the wand, that now that one black family is living in public housing, we can dismiss, we can dismiss all of the other black people who have to live in public housing of a different sort. And I think that the permanent underclass, when you talk about Professor William Jules Wilson, who talks about, in part, the permanent underclass, you had a shift from manufacturing to service industries. You had the global export of capital. You had the demobilization <laughs> of African-American and Latino people with infrastructures of transportation that used to go not go out to the suburbs. Now that white brothers and sisters have moved back to the cities and gentrified them, look at, look at this city you are living in right now, or those who are here, and now the poor people have been pushed out to the suburbs and exurbs, and so the narrative you have running is that white America elected twice a black president. Most white Americans never voted for Barack Obama. The white Americans who were against him got outvoted twice. And so what you saw was the perception of an extraordinary figure like a Barack Obama being representative in a way that he wasn't quite representative. Because the data uh, that Brother Reeves speaks about suggests that we have been dealing with a kind of Dickens like the best of times, the worst of time. But the mass, masses of black people have been stuck in a kind of cycle of poverty that situates itself generation after generation. And as a result of that, even when we talk about the angst of the, of the working poor and the working class, notice we don't talk about the black and Latino poor people. We're talking about dominant white brothers and sisters. And understandably, for them, Barack Obama did not represent the kind of be-all and end-all. He represented the very thing that they were opposed to, the perception that black people were getting things they didn't deserve, that affirmative action that Skip Gates speaks about without qualification. Right, speaks about the necessity for that, which is quite unusual even in this day and age because mm -hmm. affirmative action to some people means, oh, I'm getting in some people who don't deserve it. Right. Yeah. Michael Jordan couldn't play in a league where the first black ball player, Earl Lloyd, just died this year. Now, Michael Jordan ain't nobody's example of inferiority when it comes <laughs> to basketball, despite the great Boston Celtics um, and Bill Russell and Bob Cousy. Bob Cousy and Larry Bird ain't had nothing on Michael Jordan. So the reality is, we're, the affirmative action simply says, we're going to let a Charlene Hunter Galt, a legendary journalist, we're going to permit her to bless us. Mm -hmm. Black people always have to beg America to allow us to come in to bless you. And so affirmative action says, give us the entree into this. It doesn't mean that every black person is extraordinary and talented, but most white folk aren't either. The mediocrity of whiteness has become normalized, and black people have to be, no disrespect, and black people, <laughs> right, all of y'all are exceptional white people. You're <laughs> exceptional white people. Right. But the, but the Should masses. I stop you before you dig yourself into <laughs> people? <laughs> oh, oh, no, I'm a preacher. I resurrect people, too. Yeah. So what's interesting, what's interesting, no, my next book is on whiteness. I'm, I'm there. So, so I think that, that, that affirmative action is critical. The masses of black people have been demobilized. And I think what we have to do in this country is to face the fact that there is a huge crisis and a gulf between the have-gots and the have-nots. And the African-American people who are doing well are doing extraordinarily well. But the masses of black people have not been doing as well. But let me ask you this question. Um, you know, I, I looked at the data too, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of poor white people yes. as well as there are a lot of poor black people. Right. Now, a lot of that has to do with industrialization and technological changes. Right. How is it that they don't see, and we just saw this in the, in the, in the election, yes. how, how is it they don't see that they have the same problem? Let me get somebody else right. to speak on that. Would you like to? Yeah, I mean, well, f first thing I would say to those folks in Florida is please vote locally. They didn't. Right? They need to vote locally as well. I don't get so, just so Can caught up Can you come down the, and tell them that? I, I, I have some relatives <laughs> down there. Please vote. But, but the, this is, I don't understand how this was absent from the conversation. Mm. Um, I think sometimes it's just easier to talk to people in socioeconomic pain through the rhetoric of hate. But the reality is, is that 
unless we're going to like destroy a whole bunch of machines and roll back technological advancement, there's no way to recuperate from the post-industrial economy. That's whether you're black, white, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like when you see the images of the South Bronx, I'm so glad that's in the film so people can mm -hmm. see because mm -hmm. that's the canary in the mine, mm -hmm. right? That's even before Flint. That's even before, I mean, you, when you see that kind of residential destruction as a, as a consequence of the post-industrial economy, you can get a sense of where the nation is headed. But for those of us on the left, I don't think we've done a good enough job of community because yes, trade agreements are problematic and they, they have certain kinds of deleterious consequences economically, but this is a machine economy. Are, are we gonna like, roll? we can roll back racial rights and you can roll back Roe v. Wade. Are you gonna roll back technological advancement? Are you gonna somehow unbuild the machines that are doing the, the work in some of these communities? So I, I don't think we've, we've struck the, the right chord with communicating about the sort of post-industrial economy and really even beyond that, the service industries, just, just where we are economically has not been effectively communicated. Richard, I'd like you to comment on that. And also uh, you said something I think is very important you said people aren't talking about it, and I think a lot of that has to do with my own profession, mm. uh, which I think has to be held account for what has happened in this country in the last, well, I won't go there yet. Mm. So yeah. why don't, uh, can you comment on that? <clears throat> um, I think that this is about a loss of relative status, mm. particularly for white men and modestly educated white men. Um, and I'm gonna quote, Dana, who said at an event here, uh, equality always feels like a loss to the people who are previously unfairly ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not suggesting for a moment that that sort of painful transition is necessarily easy, but I, I think when, when we look at what's happening, it's not actually poor whites who propelled Trump to the presidency, even though they voted for him. It was Sorry, actually middle income, middle income, income, middle income, income average. Um, yeah. and, it's, and I think as we kind of look at that, I think this point about defining whiteness, you know, I was, I've been reading a lot of James Bolden at the moment, mm. and I discovered, you know, I became American a month ago, but I also feel, and one of my kids said this to me, he said, I feel like I've also become white. Um, by coming to America. James Bolton says nobody was white before they came to America. Mm. It took generations and a vast amount of coercion before this became a white country. And so mm. actually, to the extent that whiteness has been defined against, in opposition to, and in, super, in a superior position to, the apparent, and I quote, I stress apparent, rise of Latinos and black Americans has threatened the automatic status that went to white men, even those of modest skills. Elder. They feel that's gone and that's threatening them. Yeah. Uh, Eleanor, do you, you think that, I mean, because people talked about white fear during this campaign, do you think that's at work in, in, in how people are reacting? Yeah, and I think a lot of that doesn't have to do with black people at all. It has to do with globalization. It has to do with the loss of automatic rising status <coughs> for white men. This conversation, like so many other conversations, really tends to merge civil rights or rights and economic matters. Mm -hmm. Civil rights movement was not an economic movement. Mm -hmm. People didn't have the right to go to school mm -hmm. in the same schools in this town, for example, mm -hmm. to eat in the same places. Now we're into, uh, and yet throughout this conversation, we've been talking about blackness and poverty as if those merge. The civil rights movement tried it. affirmative action, for example, had a lot to do with economic mobility. But the fact is that when it gets down to economic mobility and 2016 and the recent election, you are talking about Western society. And you are talking about societies in Europe and in the United States where the dominant populations automatically got better, and in a global economy, it turns out that other people, non-white people, have gotten better somewhat. Uh, and, and the whole, if you look at the globalization uh, uh, picture, that is not a zero-sum game, but it appears that way if you are a white man in America uh, or in Europe, and if ever there was a time when you needed truly great leadership and don't have it, this is the time. Somebody needs to explain that 
uh, to Americans of every race. Okay, so I want everybody to comment on that if you want to, but do it briefly because I have about five more questions and five minutes to add, ask them. <laughs> so I just want to jump in for a second because um, something that you said really uh, it, it puts me in mind of a silver lining that we would not expect <coughs> to identify. It's a little perverse in this way. One of the things that I think we're going to learn in the next four years is that race still matters and racism still matters, mm -hmm. right? That word that we don't like to talk about, right? Because we're not merging anymore an economic fix with a racial or ethnic fix. We have to look at the fact, and I always quote the statistic, right? Infant mortality is twice as high for blacks as it is for whites around this world, in this country especially, right? You don't fix that by educating black women, and you don't fix it by increasing our income, right? We stay in a position of losing our children almost twice as often as whites who are uneducated, not even a high school education, and below the poverty level, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Race as race matters, mm -hmm. right? Oh, you said race matters. That's my series on public television. Mm -hmm. yes. right. <laughs> and that's why I said it. it. Thank that's you. That's exactly why I said it, right? That was a great point, When though. you look mm -hmm. at middle class, what we have talked about is middle class African Americans. Middle class African Americans are still more likely to live in poor neighborhoods than whites right. are, right. and more likely to live in segregated neighborhoods than whites are, right? So unless we talk about race and racism and what it's doing, and we must do that now, right? right? So if there's a silver lining to be had, we are going to have to talk about racism again. We are going to have to repair mm -hmm. and address racism again. Mm -hmm. Okay, real quick though, when you say we, who is it? You know, it's like my brother-in-law, he kept talking about they this, they that, and I said, well, and it was very conspiratorial, and I said, well, who is this they you keep talking about? And he says, well, if you have to ask me that, they've gotten to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to know, I was looking for a nice way to say it. I'm shaking yeah, yeah. my head. No, so like, so I, I want to know, you think they your, are coming who, to help who is, us? Who is your we? Who is we? Yes. Yeah. So um, the reason there's a natural hair movement, the reason that there's a hip hop movement, the reason that we are killing it in academics and in music is because we black people, first of all, have to know who we are and speak for ourselves. Okay. Now, I will say that one of the facts that does not escape me is that we are here at Brookings, right? And so we have allies that we did not have before. Mm -hmm. We have accomplished something in the past 50 years. So we have more tools at our disposal, right? But I believe the movement has to be internal. That's a, on the, in oh, terms uh, of the. Uh, wait, hang on just one second because they're giving me the sharp eye over here. Yeah. I'll, get, I'll get to you in one second. Mm -hmm. But this is where I want to go, and I hope I'm going to let you mm -hmm. say whatever you have to say, but I'd like you to incorporate what I'm about to ask you about mm -hmm. because I'm, I want to talk about hope for tomorrow mm -hmm. because DeRay McKesson, who's been arrested as many times as John Lewis was hit in the head during the Civil <laughs> Rights Movement. And yet both of them are still hopeful. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of where I want to go. Now you can say whatever you want to say, but get the say, but get the hope. I'm a preacher. I'm gonna end on hope. All right. Okay. So but we gotta go through hell first. So what's interesting <laughs> But is but make that it brief, darling. I, hell is real hot and it's brief. So okay. <laughs> for me, I think that when we talk about let's be we're gonna be honest about the conversation. Poor white people have been sold a bill of goods. They've been told what's keeping you down is the blacks. Look at my blacks over here. So what's interesting is that blacks have been demonized as the source, and you've heard the brilliant analysis here, the, the, the deindustrialization, post-industrialization, shift from manufacturing to service industries, the way in which black people have been criminalized, white people have been sold to good who are poor, who have more in common with other poor black people yes. and Latino people yes. than they have with anybody else. But they've been sold a bill of goods that it's the boogeyman over here who's hurting you. So now when we say this is a referendum on class, it's not. The average voter for Trump makes $72,000. So crazy, that means there's a manipulation of that poverty and what right. Du Bois called the wages of whiteness, the psychic wages of whiteness. At least I'm not a Negro. Exactly. So in that case, I think poor white people, class hurts, but race makes class hurts more. Hopefulness, look, hope is a, is a deep and profound virtue. Optimism is a shallow virtue. Reinhold Niebuhr talked about that. I think we have hope when we have the hope of telling the truth to the dominant culture to say, look, whiteness is not working for you either. Whiteness is not working for anybody in America. So let's kill whiteness and reinvent Americanness and American identity. Because the moment white people stop being white, America becomes a great nation. Holmes Norton, tell me about hope. And in closing, 
uh, in your closing statement about hope, uh, not that it's going to do any good, but um, what is your uh, advice to the incoming president uh, in terms of doing something about all of this in 10 seconds or less? <laughs> Uh, look, I, having grown up in a city that was segregated, having been in the civil rights movement, the women's movement, and now in the Do Nothing Congress, which has now been captured uh, by people who want to do a lot to people, uh, and especially in, in, in the city I represent, uh, I, I, the, the, the greatest, uh, the, the, the worst reaction uh, we could have to the new administration is hopelessness, and yet I see that all around me. Mm -hmm. um, if it doesn't raise the fight in you right. mm -hmm. to see Jeff right. Sessions mm -hmm. appointed mm -hmm. Attorney General of the United mm -hmm. States, then you are brain dead. Mm -hmm. So the, the notion of, of hope is a kind of passive emotion mm -hmm. that I have never had. It is the fight emotion, it seems to me, that ought to spring from you when you see and hear mm -hmm. the emergence of a now quite outspoken white movement mm -hmm. where they're essentially making the same arguments we made in terms of equality, now in terms of sheer whiteness. So, so if, 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 if you're feeling hopeless, you've got the wrong emotion going for you. Very quickly, Mike. Um, look, Donald Trump, if it turns out to be true that he is the president, and he is, uh, then... <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> yeah, right. Still holding out. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Get that damn recount going. So, uh, so the thing is, is that, look, the hope is that Donald Trump turns out to be what people said he was, that he's not really, quote, a right-wing ideologue. The problem is he's drawing people around him who are. You've got an avowed white nationalist as his chief strategist. Mm -hmm. You've got a Jeff Sessions who's problematic. So what we have to do is do what Howard Thurman said. Howard Thurman, the great black mystic, said, refuse to reduce your life to the event of your experience right now. Our slave foreparents, he said, look forward to a day they couldn't even imagine, but they imagined it anyhow. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is to say, my pastor said, we have already come to what we've come to through what we've come to. <laughs> we've been here before. This is not the first time. We can overcome. We have to remember what we did before. And when we do that, we don't give in to hopelessness. We challenge this with every fiber of our being. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dana? <laughs> Yeah, I'm definitely going to continue the fight motif. Um, Sherilyn Eiffel gave a speech, and she was sitting at Thurgood Marshall's desk, and she said, like you did, we have been here before. Mm -hmm. And every time that we have fought in unity, we have won. Yeah. So it's like we get a reset and a, re a do-over. I look at this film, and I am inspired when I see how far we have come and what odds we overcame, and I feel like I can do it again, mm -hmm. right? I look at this film, and I look at the new resources that are at our disposal that weren't at our disposal before, right, and yeah. I know that the, the, the bar has moved. I know that racism has changed. Mm -hmm. It has morphed. It is no longer just segregation. It is implicit and unconscious and unintentional, all kinds of things that are complicated. But look at what's happening up here. The resources are up to the task. And so I would say we've been here before, and we will do it again, but we will do it better. We'll take more people with us. We won't make the mistakes that we made before. But I feel ready for the fight. Okay. Thank you. you know, it's a, and don't forget the other part of the question, the advice to the president, well, as it relates to black people. Yeah, my, my advice to President like Trump Watch your is, back. Is, yeah, be careful. Seriously. Be careful. My, my advice to President like Trump. And that's not, that's not a threat. It's just a, Oh, not a to, physical to, threat. To, no, just be careful of, of, of over thinking the world that you think you're inheriting, right? You, you, know, you have to be much clearer on the world that you're actually entering into. You can surround yourself with a bunch of sort of myopic people who are going to tell you what you want to hear or pander to who you think got you into that office, but you really have to understand the terrain of the world. And I think he got that in his first encounter with, with President Obama in, in, that, in that first meeting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I agree with the panel here. If, you know, a lot of young people are really upset and, and yeah. distraught out of this. I've had more young people crying in my office hours this week than I did during 9-11, and I taught class on the day of 9-11. Yeah. And so th this is a tremendously traumatic thing for them, but I, I tell them two things. Number one, remember how you felt on 11-9. Like, remember how you felt when you first saw this result. Remember that feeling and embrace it. You know why? Because that's how I feel every day when I wake up. I feel that way every day when I wake up. The anguish that you feel, 
the dissonance from, from society, the, the sort of anguish about people of color, women and trans folks and all the folks who are vulnerable. That's how I feel every day when I wake up. Mm. So remember how you felt on that day and you got to carry that with you. And the second thing I say is, look, now you can't leave. Right? <laughs> all, all this talk, people want to leave, they want to go to another. Are you crazy? Where you, where you going to go? Where you going to go? Not only, but I, listen, listen. My ancestors built this country. They right. built that White House. They built the roads. They built the bridges. They literally built it. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> right? We're not going anywhere. So I'm, I'm hopeful that folks can be em em empathetic about how they felt on that day, right? And, and, and carry that with them forward as we continue to do the work that we got to do. Follow up. Thanks. Um, <laughs> only uh, half, the, half the school children in the US now are white. Um, the election was about race, it was about other things too, but the education gap among whites um, <coughs> disappears entirely if you control for the racial attitudes of the whites. So I think if you kind of look at it statistically, um, and this is a very short quote, uh, again from Baldwin, his letter to his nephew on the, on the emancipation is great. He said, the danger in the minds of wo most white Americans is the loss of their identity. The black man has functioned in the white man's world as a fixed star, mm. as an immovable pillar, and as he moves out of his place, heaven and earth are shaken out of their foundations. Mm. If we think that, if we, uh, and here I think I can authentically speak as someone who's both a new American and white, white racism has to be fought by whites. Mm. Uh, and so I think there's a huge responsibility among whites not to sort of run silent and think of it as somehow the responsibility of black and Latino Americans to fight white racism. I just want to thank all of you, and I want to close by saying that I'm, I'm hopeful, uh, I, and not least because um, I was talking to a group of students uh, just the day after the uh, election, and they were expressing angst and anxiety and, and fear. And I told them uh, what uh, we shared at Gwen Eiffel's uh, funeral the other day. Uh, she grew up in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, as did I. And we were taught that our history is our armor. And that is why I, I shared that with the young people. And that is why I readily agree to do anything Skip Gates asked me to do in relationship to this series because this series is a part of our armor and it's armor for black people, it's armor for white people because our fight was not a fight by black people alone. White people died for us. And so it's a fight for all of us. I agree with you on the fact that white people talk to white people, sure, but this is, a, this is a job for all of us, and we have our armor, and we can march forward till victory is won. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Glenn, and everyone at Brookings for generously hosting this evening. Uh, the conversation, as always with Skip, has been stimulating, and it's a great example of the fact that both of our missions, uh, public broadcasting and, we, and Brookings, really align on evenings like tonight. WIDA is the flagship station in Washington, D.C., and as such, we have a very special civic responsibility to, to the to nation to explain what is happening in, we, in Washington. And for those of us who've been around forever, it's hard for us to understand, and yet we really understand how especially younger people are taking current events as a shock to their system. They haven't lived as long as we have and through as many battles as we have. So it's all new to them, and their naivete sometimes is refreshing and energizing, but now it's not helping them as a coping mechanism. So through the PBS NewsHour, through Washington Week, and through partnering with other filmmakers, we're trying to explain not only America's history, but our present. Um, so tonight's uh, conversation, film, and panel have underscored the timeliness, of course, of this amazing project created by Skip, as if he knew what was gonna happen. The timing was impeccable, 
as always, I've long admired Skip's scholarship and leadership as a public intellectual, because that is who he is. He's a filmmaker, thought leader. He always expands our understanding of where we are with race in America. So thank you panelists very much for coming. We appreciate all of your insights. It was especially electric tonight. We really appreciate that. And I wanna tell our audience that I hope that you will watch part two tomorrow night at eight o'clock on WIDA 26. So if you missed part one, you can watch it now on pbs.org slash black America. The series will also be rebroadcast, the entire series, all four hours, on Sunday, November 27th, starting at 2 o'clock. So as the relatives leave, relatives leave, you shut the door quietly and enjoy the next four hours <laughs> uh, all for yourselves. I'm happy to announce that by the end of November, this series will have aired 4,000 Se separate times in broadcasts through public broadcasting stations all across the country. That's just in this month. <laughs>